Okay. Uh, I am I am thrilled to introduce you, Dave. Um, I'm also a little bit embarrassed because you know we've I think we've known each other for more than three decades. I, I think you're uh, right. I, uh, that's that's truly embarrassing. I had color in my hair when when we first <laughs> met, and I'm not going to comment on the state of your hair then, um, Dave. Dave, uh, you. I don't really even have to read my notes because I already know. I know by heart that uh, you you did your bachelor's degree at, at at UCLA in biochem. You did your PhD in in I think it was biological sciences, but it was biochem anyways, right? At, right. at UC UC Irvine, and you continued. I think in your undergrad uh, supervisor's lab for your PhD. Is that wrong? Oh, for, for a couple of months, um, I stayed there as a postdoc after I graduated, and then I moved on to a, a real postdoc. I see. That, yes, you did move on to a real postdoc. You saw the light. You went to <laughs> you went to University of Washington and postdoc in in the Earl Davies lab. And so he he is responsible for so many people working in coagulation, and you're one of them. Uh, you, you're now in Portland, Oregon at Oregon Health and Science University, and I've had the pleasure to join you there for a talk. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, a, a little while ago. And you are a full professor there, and you are also the founder and chief scientific officer of Gamma, um, uh, I, I can't remember, is it Gamma Therapeutic? No, Gamma Diagnostics. Very good. I have, I have forgotten. <laughs> so I, we, did, I should have looked at my notes. <laughs> We, we um, changed the name just this year, so it's a rebranding. Thank you. Thank you for correct, almost having to correct me there. Uh, but uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say with correlations between gamma fibrinogen and uh, COVID and anything else you'd like to tell us about today. So thanks very much for joining us and taking the time. Well, I appreciate the, the invitation. Let me share my slides with you here. Thank you. And make sure that you can see them all. Is there those showing for you? Yes, they are. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Yeah. I I I decided on this title because this is this was what I was thinking. Gamma prime fibrinogen and COVID nineteen. Who knew? Um, you know, this was not something that you know that came to mind immediately. Um, so I'm going to take you down this journey. Um, one step at a time because the the connection between the two is not obvious all right but I, first i got to give you my conflicts of interest uh, i'm very conflicted um and as uh, ed said i'm the founder and chief scientific office officer of gamma diagnostics and i always have to put up this disclaimer whenever i give medical student and graduate student lectures um the other disclosure is um don't buy one of my rock band CDs. Absolutely not, don't do that. Okay, so this is gonna be the roadmap for what I'm doing today. First, I'm gonna introduce you to what is gamma prime fibrinogen for those of you who have never heard of it, which is probably most of you. Uh, and then I'm gonna segue into thrombin interactions with it and then go into a historical uh, di digression into its role in hemostasis and, and go into some of the controversies in the field. And then finally uh, end up with the main event, which is uh, what's its role in COVID-19? All right, so for those of you who have never seen it, this is gamma prime fibrinogen. Actually, this is fibrinogen. This was from a crystal structure published by uh, Carolyn Cohen's lab back in 2000. And you can see that uh, fibrinogen has three different colored chains, uh, A alpha shown in blue, B beta shown in green, and gamma shown in red. And there's two copies of each of them so that all the amino termini are here and then one chain goes off one way and the other chain goes off the other way. So it's actually a six chain protein. Um, the only difference between normal fibrinogen, or I should say more abundant total fibrinogen and gamma prime fibrinogen is over here in this little carboxy terminus right there at the end. That's the only difference between gamma prime fibrinogen and the more common gamma A form of fibrinogen. So before I get into that though, let me explain a bit about fibrinogen biology. So 
for the uninitiated here who have never seen the uh, lovely coagulation cascade, um, fibrin formation begins when thrombin clips off these short peptides from the A alpha and B beta chain, fibrinopeptides A and B. And this exposes cryptic polymerization sites. And when it's clipped off like that, um, it's referred to as a fibrin monomer now rather than fibrinogen. So these fibrin monomers spontaneously assemble and they polymerize with each other. And then that non-covalent interaction is then turned into a covalent clot through the action of factor 13A, which is the only transglutaminase in the clotting cascade. And it forms these uh, gamma glutamyl epsilon lysine bridges between uh, glutamate and lyse or glutamine and lysine side chains uh, that are close enough together in fibrin. So this would be one fibrin monomer right here, uh, designated by the little black bars. This would be a second one here. So you can see they line up end to end, but then in the background shown with this bar and this bar is a third one, which is half staggered from the other two. And this is how it lines up to make a two-stranded protofibril. And then each of those two-stranded protofibrils can then uh, aggregate with each other. And the process goes on and on and on until finally you get this big macroscopic three-dimensional structure, which traps the platelets, which are shown here as blue. I don't know why they're not blue. And the red cells, which are indeed red. And it branches and does all this stuff. So that's what basically um, keeps you from bleeding to death. Now, the three chains of fibrinogen are made off of separate genes on chromosome four, and they're all in, in tight linkage disequilibrium with each other. And uh, each one is, is made into a separate messenger RNA in the liver and only the liver, although there's some evidence that it could be made in the lungs. Um, and then it's translated and assembled into this six chain protein. Now, where you get gamma prime fibrinogen from is in the splicing event that happens in the gamma chain, in the pre-mRNA. So normally what happens is that you get spliceosome activity coming in and cutting at the exon nine, intron nine boundary and the intron nine, exon 10 boundary. Those are then put together and you end up with what's called the gamma A isoform. This is the most common isoform of fibrinogen. And exon 10 encodes uh, four amino acids, which happen to be uh, a platelet binding site, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but about three to 4% of the time, what happens is there's an internal polyadenylation site that can be recognized here. And if that's recognized first, what will happen is the spliceosome or the, uh, the uh, polyadenylation complex will come in, cut off the three prime end of this so that you essentially lose your splice site over here. And that is then polyadenylated and translated. And so when that's translated, you read into what was previously a non-coding intron and it codes for these 20 amino acids that are completely different than in the gamma A form. And if you look at the uh, single letter amino acid code, this is a good one for the graduate students to see if they can learn the single amino acid code. There's a lot of E's and D's in this, okay? Uh, glutamic acid and aspartic acid. And these two Y's, which are tyrosines, um, are actually sulfated post-translationally. So that is all adding up to a lot of negative charge and that'll become important in just a minute. So the properties of this, which again, is only different in that tiny little piece at the carboxyl terminus of the gamma chain. Um, the gamma prime form of fibrinogen contains a high affinity thrombin binding site. And I'll show you some of the data for that. It forms clots that are resistant to fibrinolysis, breakdown by plasmin and uh, the associated uh, activation complex that goes with that with TPA. Um, it's also an inflammatory biomarker, and I'll show you some of our data for that. And in several studies now, in epidemiologic studies, it's been strongly associated with cardiovascular disease. Okay, so that leads me to thrombin interactions with gamma prime fibrinogen. So I'm gonna focus on that just a bit because that will set the stage for fibrinogen's role in hemostasis. So I'm gonna give you the, the model first 
because I think this, I, I'm very visual on this. This gives me a, a roadmap to go by. So thrombin has uh, an active site, which is shown by this little Pac-Man mouth. And it's got two exocytes that are anion binding exocytes. This one is supposed to be exocyte two, which I'll get to in a second. So what thrombin does as a protease through its active site is it cuts off these little fibrinopeptides A and B on the A alpha and B beta chain. And then once it does that, this is referred to as fibrin monomer. So these fibrin monomers spontaneously polymerize together and form that two-stranded protofibril that I showed you uh, in the model previously. And then once they're done, if you have a gamma prime chain in there, it can bind to thrombin through this exocyte two. And the exocyte two uh, is shown here in a, a crystal structure that was solved by Al Talinsky way back in 1992. And what I've done is highlighted the uh, positively charged amino acids, the arginines and uh, ly uh, yeah, lysines in the uh, active or in the exocytes. So this is exocyte two, which is on the opposite side of the molecule from exocyte one. Exocyte one is well known as binding things like herudin. Um, and here is the active site, which has the inhibitor PPAC stuck in its mouth here. Um, so it's exocyte two that binds to fibrinogen gamma prime chain, and it actually leaves the PPAC active site open in that case. So my graduate student, Christine Alexander, uh, several years ago, uh, decided to look at the role of these positively or negatively charged amino acids in binding to the positively charged exocyte uh, two. And this was taken from a crystal structure by Pineda et al. And you can see that this is the gamma prime chain in green. There's a whole bunch of these uh, amino acids, the E's and D's and uh, tyrosines, um, some of which are in direct contact with thrombin. And so she decided to individually mutate all of these from charged to uncharged. So she would convert a glutamic acid to a glutamine or an aspartic acid to an asparagine or a phosphotyrosine uh, into a regular tyrosine. We use phosphotyrosine instead of sulfotyrosine because it was technically easier to synthesize this. And what she found was that none of these single mutations, which are all shown up here, individually really had much effect. I mean, the, the ones with the most effect really only um, increased the KD less than twofold. So, Kind of the take home message from this was that none of the important amino acids are really that important individually when you look at them. Um, so she decided to um, look at clusters of these things, uh, particularly uh, these ones here in the center, because those are the ones that are shown here to be actually close enough to be in contact. So she repeated these um, surface plasmon resonance studies um, up in Jose Lopez's lab at uh, uh, Puget Sound Blood, what was then Puget Sound Blood Center, now Bloodworks Northwest. And sure enough, uh, this was the surface plasma on resonance from the BIACOR experiments, increasing amounts of the wild type peptide, you get increased binding. Um, but if she mutated out the two phosphotyrosines and the um, aspartic acid in between, um, you got essentially no binding. It was just dead. So she thought, okay, well then let's look at the contribution of these surrounding amino acids, which are shown here in green. What if you mutate those? Well, guess what? You, you mutate those out and it's superimposed under this blue line. It doesn't bind either. So kind of our take home message from this was that really the charged amino acids contribute to binding as an ensemble. Uh, so any single one isn't that important, but together, they form this very high affinity binding site, which I will mention has an incredibly fast on rate and an incredibly fast off rate, which I've been told is typical of electrostatic interactions uh, for protein-protein interactions. Okay, so now we get into what does the binding of thrombin to this gamma prime chain actually do? Well, for one thing, 
It protects it from inhibition by antithrombin and heparin cofactor two. And this was a study by Jeff Weitz's lab several years ago. And what they did in this experiment was they added antithrombin plus heparin and thrombin, made a clot, and then measured the residual thrombin activity afterwards using a, a peptide substrate, and then looked at the fold reduction in the inhibition rate compared to fluid, uh, where you're just looking at the inhibition rate of uh, thrombin by the AT3 heparin complex. And they showed that you got a decrease in the um, second order rate constant of inhibition if you simply added gamma A fibrin. So there is a low affinity thrombin binding site on gamma A fibrin, which probably accounts for this. And then if they added a, an antibody, polyclonal antibody to the gamma prime chain, uh, there was really no difference. In contrast, if they made the clot with gamma prime fibrinogen, it was actually protected against um, inhibition by AT3 by reducing the second order rate constant for this. But if they added this peptide or anti-peptide antibody, it then came back down to about the level you saw with gamma A fibrin. So this residual activity is probably the same as this. But this is showing that the gamma prime chain itself is contributing a lot to preventing thrombin inhibition by AT3. And the same thing was true with heparin cofactor two and dermatan sulfate, which is the cofactor for that. And the other thing is that gamma prime fibrinogen forms fibrin clots that are denser and are also, um, do not have as, as much flow through them, like a three times reduction in, in flow. And that's because they make these thinner fibers that are closely packed together compared to the gamma A fibrin. And this was work done by a postdoc in my lab, Veronica Flood, um, who went to John Weissel's lab and uh, did some beautiful EMs in his lab there. And gamma prime fibrinogen is resistant to fibrinolysis. And this was a study that my first graduate student, Lisa Falls did, where she took a fibrinogenemic plasma and spiked it with I-125 labeled either gamma A fibrinogen or gamma prime fibrinogen and let it incubate for a week at 37 degrees. And by the end of the week, you can see that the gamma A fibrin had completely lysed, but the gamma prime fibrin was literally intact, just as strong as it was on day one. So with that, you might think that gamma prime fibrinogen is going to be prothrombotic, but wait a minute, there's other data. So we did inhibition studies um, doing clotting times with whole human plasma. And we found that the um, gamma prime peptide was an anticoagulant, that it would inhibit clotting compared to the scrambled peptide here. And it would also prevent factor eight activation. So showing here the, um, the cleavage of factor eight by thrombin, uh, which goes into the light chain, the A1 and the A2 subunits, in the presence of the peptide, it stayed intact all the way through here. So that doesn't sound like a procoagulant mechanism. That sounds very anticoagulant too. Now, we looked at the ability of the peptide to prevent thrombin-induced platelet aggregation, and sure enough, it inhibited that very profoundly compared to uh, thrombin-induced platelet aggregation without the peptide. But there was a problem with the interpretation of, of this. And that is that uh, in this uh, science cartoon uh, by the late Evan Sadler, um, there's a binding site on uh, thrombin, which is exocyte two, for glycoprotein 1b, which is shown here and here. Um, so this is exocyte 2 binding to glycoprotein 1b, and that orients thrombin so that it can then cleave the PAR receptors, PAR1, PAR4 on platelets through its active site, which is shown in red here. So the peptide might not be inhibiting the active site in this scenario. It might be inhibiting this binding, which would then make the cleavage less favorable. So we did it with intact fibrinogen. And sure enough, gamma A, gamma prime fibrinogen, which is the, the natural plasma form of it, 
um, it's normally found as a heterodimer with the more common gamma A form just because of uh, stoichiometry. Um, it does not uh, support much platelet aggregation compared to gamma A or um, unfractionated fibrinogen shown here. But again, there's a caveat to this, and that is that fibrinogen has to bridge glycoprotein 2B3A on platelets in order for them to aggregate. And so if one end here is gamma prime, it lacks that um, exon 10 binding domain, so it can't aggregate the platelet. So, so again, this was a little bit problematic in trying to explain the results uh, you know, in a hard and fast way. So this, this for years has raised the question, is gamma prime fibrinogen antithrombotic or prothrombotic? So on the one hand, summarizing all the stuff I just showed you, the antithrombotic argument would say, well, it inhibits the APTT, the activated partial thromboplastin time, uh, acts just like an, an anticoagulant. And it inhibits factor eight cleavage uh, by thrombin. And it inhibits platelet aggregation by thrombin. On the flip side, uh, it could be prothrombotic because it protects thrombin from antithrombin three in, in activation and heparin cofactor two as well. And it forms clots that are less permeable and it forms clots that are resistant to fibrinolysis. So it's kind of like a balance. It's like, which, which one prevails in, in the end? And part of the, the bias I think in this came from this early 1945 science paper um, by Walter Seegers, note on the adsorption of thrombin on fibrin. And what he found was that if you clot um, fibrin with, with purified thrombin, you lose free thrombin and it's apparently bound to the clot. So he, he named this antithrombin one. He was also the person who named antithrombin three. Um, so Antithrombin one was defined as the absorption of thrombin on fibrin, and it was um, has been accepted for many many years as an antithrombotic kind of thing that takes free thrombin out of solution and makes it unavailable um, in the same way that antithrombin three makes it unavailable. But there, it's through a totally different mechanism because antithrombin three is a serpent that inhibits the active site. But I think this just this is, is the one that I am putting a lot of weight on right now in my interpretations. And this came out of uh, Robert Arian's lab just this year, last year. And what they did was in vitro studies with different amounts of gamma prime fibrinogen shown here in, in the yellow, um, ratios of that to, uh, anti, uh, to gamma A. And so in, in some cases you'd have a lot of the gamma prime, in some places you would have very little. And then they flowed this over uh, a uh, in vitro system where they had platelets bound here. And then they would measure the amount of fibrin that was being deposited. And the bottom line was the more gamma prime you added to this, the more you got fibrin deposition. So this is extremely different than what you see under static conditions. And I think that has been the part that has confused us for so many years, is that all this is happening in flowing blood. And I think what gamma prime fibrinogen does in this case is it provides a binding site for thrombin, gives you more clot bound thrombin that's unable to be inhibited by antithrombin three, and just keeps activating more and more fibrin to form this. So very different than what we saw in static conditions. And this is some of his data showing the uh, deposition of fibrin here. We're using 3% gamma prime, 10% uh, and 30%. So you're seeing a lot more. And this is under venous conditions. This is under arterial conditions. It happens under both conditions. Okay, so that leads us to what is gamma prime fibrinogen's role in hemostasis? Well, we have done a couple of studies now uh, dabbling in epidemiology, and you have to ask yourself, what is a biochemist doing 
epidemiology for. And, you know, it was one of those things that I just kind of got dragged into it. I, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I know a few people who are. So I called them. Um, so this was a study that uh, my postdoc, Rahana Lovely, did uh, in collaboration with the uh, Framingham Heart Study. So this was a study we did with the Framingham Offspring cohort. And what she was looking at was prevalent cardiovascular disease in those patients. In other words, she took all these blood, like 3,000 blood samples from one of the visits of the Framingham Offspring cohort and measured gamma prime fibrinogen in them and then did the analysis to see uh, which of those patients had cardiovascular disease, either all cardiovascular diseases considered, which includes heart attack, uh, unstable angina, stroke, transient ischemic attacks or intermittent claudication, which is more like peripheral artery disease, uh, or hard CVD, uh, which really is only heart attack and stroke, um, and then hard coronary heart disease, which is just heart attack without angina, and then hard stroke, which is stroke without transient ischemic attacks. And the strongest correlation was with hard coronary heart disease. Uh, adjusted odds ratio, comparing the, the highest to the lowest tertile of 1.76. Um, and if you looked at the associations between gamma prime fibrinogen and other known risk factors, and some of these are the, the Framingham risk factors that go into the Framingham score that uh, cardiologists use to assess a patient's risk, uh, what you see is that it's associated with a bunch of these things except for total cholesterol and systolic blood pressure, which kind of makes sense because there's no direct correlation that I can think of between those two. Um, we also did another study that I thought was really interesting that set us off in a kind of a different direction of thinking. And that was the PAVE study, which stood for periodontitis and vascular events. And it was meant to be an interventional trial to enroll patients who had had a heart attack within the last three years and also had really bad periodontal disease, so like gum bleeding and loss of teeth. And what the plan was, was to ask the question, does periodontal inflammation cause or contribute to heart attack? So these are people who are at high risk for having a second heart attack. And the idea was to um, intervene and give them really aggressive periodontal disease treatment, antibiotics, cleaning, all this stuff, and see if that resulted in lower uh, heart attack rates later. Unfortunately, they never got be beyond the pilot study where they enrolled the patients. Uh, but that was fine for us because we were able to then measure the gamma prime fibrinogen in these patients. And at the time, this was the cohort that had the highest levels of gamma prime fibrinogen we had ever seen. In fact, my, my postdoc Rahana was so convinced that something had screwed up with the assay because all these patients, they were all like at the high, high, high end, you know, almost off the scale of the standards in this case. Um, but after doing a bunch of troubleshooting and comparing the assays with other known samples, she said, no, they, they all have really high le levels of gamma prime fibrinogen. The other thing that came out of it was when we looked at its association with some of these other uh, risk factors, it was C-reactive protein that was really significantly associated with it. And so that got us into thinking, ah, the link with inflammation. So now we think that gamma prime fibrinogen is upregulated by inflammation. So we chased that one down for a while. So this was work that uh, another graduate student in my lab, Chantel Reinsmith, did <clears throat> in vitro. So this is looking at HEPG2 liver cells and looking at the expression of uh, either gamma A or gamma prime fibrinogen by RT-PCR after you expose the liver cells to uh, saturating concentrations of interleukin-6. And what you can see is that although the gamma A mRNA definitely went up, you know, uh, several fold here, um, the gamma prime was very much dysregulated, went up like eight fold 
if you give it high enough levels of, of interleukin-6. So this was our first clue that there's a dysregulation between the gamma A and the gamma prime form in the presence of inflammation. All right, so enough with the background. Let's, let's get to the main event here, fibrinogen and COVID. Um, the, it was the inflammation part that got us thinking in these particular lines. So what we did is we enrolled 17 patients at my university hospital here um, who were hospitalized for COVID. And these are just the uh, descriptive stats for these people. So uh, of the 17, uh, several of them developed acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. Um, six of them <clears throat> required ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is basically an artificial lung so that they can breathe. Uh, five of them developed uh, uh, venous thrombosis. Uh, 10 of them were intubated. Uh, and a couple of them had um, treatment with these different uh, remedies for COVID. I, I should mention this was very early on in the COVID pandemic. So <clears throat> treatments were all over the map at this point. And <clears throat> the surprising thing from all this, I, I went in with these 17 samples into <laughs> the hot zone. A uh, colleague of mine named Bill Messer has a BSL two plus lab. And he let me go in there with these contaminated COVID samples before there was a vaccine, uh, had to gown up, you know, booties, masks, the whole nine yards, <clears throat> and measured gamma prime fibrinogen in these COVID patients. And then we compared them to a historical uh, group uh, from the ERIC study, the Atherosclerosis Risk and Communities trial. And this represents data from like 10,601 patients that was uh, done by Aaron Folsom's lab. And what we saw immediately is that there was a skewing in the COVID patients, including some ridiculously high outliers, way, way high up here. And, and I should mention that the um, standard curve for this assay, uh, which is a commercial assay, only goes up to 80 milligrams per deciliter. So we had to like dilute these down at the end just to be able to estimate what they were. So this was, I mean, I, I was thinking that there might be inflammation in the COVID patients because it's known that there's a cytokine storm happening in COVID patients. <clears throat> but this, this was like, you know, beyond my wildest imaginings. And then we looked at in this very small cohort, I should uh, mention, um, a couple of patients died. So two of them died. And if you looked at their mean uh, daily average gamma prime fibrinogen, either the mean or the median, they were significantly higher than the patients who did not die. And if you looked at the median levels of the patients um, who went on to ECMO, there was also a significant increase. And there was a non-significant trend with ARDS, but it didn't reach statistical significance. <clears throat> now, since then, we've done another study in India, and uh, we're at an interim point now where we have 73 people who've been enrolled. Excuse me a second. Um, Ed, can I go get myself a glass of water? Because <laughs> I'm not COVID. Yeah, you, 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 yeah, you better do that. <laughs> Let me go get, get myself a cup of water. <laughs> Okay, so in this study in India, um, so far we've enrolled about uh, 73 uh, COVID patients in the hospital there and just compared them to 19 healthy volunteers. And what we found, similar to what we found at the OHSU hospital, was that indeed uh, the COVID patients had a significantly higher level average of uh, gamma prime fibrinogen. Um, and some of the other markers that are used now to kind of assess disease progression in COVID patients have been things like D-dimers, which is often increased because of the ongoing clotting and fibrinolysis that occurs uh, in COVID patients. And sure enough, it's significantly associated. And 
ferritin levels were also uh, significantly uh, higher. And ferritin is a known acute phase reactant that goes up with inflammation. So that was consistent. Well, the ones that didn't show a significant association were what surprised me. So if we look at the gold standard of inflammation markers, CRP, there was you know, a, a trend, but it was not significant in the COVID patients. And people have been trying to use this as a marker to see uh, disease progression in COVID patients. And at least in, in our interim analysis, it has not been showing significance, um, which is why I, I pronounce uh, CRP crap, because it doesn't do anything. Um, IL-6, similarly, although it was showing a trend, but there was a lot of skew and scatter. And so it did not show a uh, significance in this study. It has shown in other people's studies as has CRP sometimes. And uh, LDH, which is more of a measure of tissue damage, uh, showed nothing either. So why do some markers of inflammation show an association and some don't? I think this is the reason. And this is based on uh, some data that uh, my graduate student, Christine Alexander, uh, did uh, many years ago. So we did a uh, intra-individual variability study for gamma prime fibrinogen and compared it to a bunch of different cardiovascular disease markers, one of which was C-reactive protein. And this is from one patient over that one year span. And in fact, it's from me. Um, and I have the scars to prove it. My graduate student, I think, enjoyed poking her mentor in with sharp objects, but anyway. Um, so what happened with the CRP, as you can see, it, it fluctuated wildly. And I can tell you exactly what happened at this peak. This was in February and I had a sinus infection. I was taking antibiotics. So my inflammation was through the roof. Um, gamma prime fibrinogen, on the other hand, although it did go up here, um, was really kind of buffered from these transient spikes. And I think the reason for that has to do with the half-lives of each of these. So the half-life of CRP was published as being 19 hours. The half-life of fibrinogen is more like four days. And I think that's why as an inflammatory marker, gamma prime fibrinogen is actually superior um, because it's not going to fluctuate wildly. Okay, so I'm gonna show you two um, case reports that we found at OHSU Hospital that I think are really interesting. So this is one patient who came into the hospital. Um, obviously, if you're gonna be hospitalized, you're, you're feeling some bad effects, <clears throat> but this patient was you know, doing okay for a while. And then in, on day eight, they developed hypoxia and they had to go on a ventilator. And so <clears throat> we got these blood samples after the fact and found out that sure enough, when their clinical condition worsened, and they developed hypoxia, their gamma prime fibrinogen levels went through the roof. Again, the, the standard for this assay stops at 80. So we had to dilute this you know, to find what was his actual level. And this was very interesting too. So this was a patient who came in and was not doing too bad on day one. And then on day two, started having uh, lung problems. Um, that led the physician to um, give him steroids, methylprednisolone. This was kind of before dexamethasone was the steroid du jour. And sure enough, after administering that, their gamma prime fibrinogen levels dropped like a rock, which is a little bit inconsistent with the long half-life that we know for fibrinogen, which makes me wonder if maybe this patient had ongoing thrombosis uh, and fibrinolysis uh, at this point um, that resulted then uh, in it going back down to normal after some of the fibrinogen was used up in that. That's just speculation. So this may have a lot of implications for what you anticoagulate a COVID patient with. And this was a paper that came out last August uh, from a huge study which essentially showed that in critically ill COVID patients, you could give them full dose heparin and it didn't make a 
bit of difference. There was no better outcomes in those patients who got full dose heparin. So the heparin wasn't working. Why wasn't the heparin working? Well, we think it's because of this. So if you've got a boatload of gamma prime fibrinogen in there, which is skyrocketing because your inflammation is going through the roof, you're gonna have a lot of clot bound thrombin. And oh, by the way, this is resistant to antithrombin. And how does antithrombin work? It uses heparin as a cofactor to inhibit the thrombin. So you put two and two together and we think we may have a reason why that didn't work, which begs the question of what should we be using? Um, and I'm thinking direct thrombin inhibitors, gar Argatraban, Dabigatran, um, her herulogs, you know, herudin compounds, speculation. So anyway, the results from this, I showed you the gamma prime fibrinogen is a splice variant and it makes up maybe 7% of total fibrinogen. And gamma prime fibrinogen binds to exocyte 2 on thrombin and this results in AT3 resistance. And it forms clots that are resistant to fibrinolysis and its levels are associated with cardiovascular disease, and they're associated with inflammation. And in our case, we've got now preliminary data to show that it's associated with disease severity in COVID-19 patients in these uh, couple of uh, 17 patients that we've looked at. And we think that it might actually contribute to the thrombosis in COVID-19 patients by giving them a large depot of clot-bound thrombin that is not able to be inactivated. So let me thank the, or tell you what we're, we're doing next before I thank everyone. Um, we're gonna complete some uh, precision and performance testing of the, the ELISA so that we can get FDA clearance for this use. Um, and we're completing these clinical studies. Uh, we have 40 patients that are now enrolled at OHSU and we're hoping to get up to 100 in our India cohort. Uh, and then to submit an FDA emergency use authorization uh, for use of this assay uh, for COVID-19 disease progression. And with, with the, the thought that maybe uh, we can do a clinical trial so that patients have, who have a really high level of gamma prime fibrinogen uh, when they have COVID could be randomized into getting either standard of care, which is heparin, or a direct thrombin inhibitor to see if, if that will work better. Um, we'd also like to look at the association between gamma prime fibrinogen and other inflammatory diseases, particularly inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's disease. Um, we think that you know because of the systemic inflammation going on in there, those might also be able to use this assay uh, to look at uh, disease progression, especially when you consider with inflammatory bowel diseases, the gold standard is not a, a blood test, it's doing a colonoscopy. And I can tell you having had one of those, that is not pleasant. Um, so if you can avoid that, it's good. All right, so now I get to thank everyone. Uh, my graduate students, I showed you some of their data, Lisa Falls, Chantel Ryan-Smith, and Christine Alexander all got their PhDs in my lab. Uh, my postdoctoral fellows, Veronica Fr Flood, Ver Rahana Lovely, and I didn't mention Matthew Hudkins was involved in uh, getting the data for the OHSU cohort that I showed you at the very end with the COVID patients. And then our other collaborators, uh, Steve Kazmerzak, who's the head of clinical chemistry here at OHSU. Akram Khan is a pulmonologist. Um, Jose Lopez up at the Bloodworks Northwest. Teresa Madden, who was involved in the PAVE study, uh, who was uh, here at, on campus at uh, that time. Bill Messer, who's the virologist uh, that I uh, worked in his lab to measure the gamma prime fibrinogen levels. Christopher O'Donnell at the Framingham Heart Study and John Weisel at UPenn. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Dave, thanks so much for an, as always, lucid talk and really informative. I really enjoyed that. Thanks a lot. Uh, people, if you have some uh, questions, you could put them in the chat, but I would encourage you to just blurt them out. Dr. C, go ahead. Hi, Dave. That was fabulous. It's really interesting. I had a question about the um, um, 
is there any does it does the client integrity change and could and then also in line with that does this have any impact on say post thrombotic syndrome or or pulmonary emboli from a deep vein thrombosis are there changes in in the adhesion of the clot to the to the wall of the vessel those are all great questions that we would love to ask. I, I will say on the venous side though, there was a rather large cohort study that was done uh, for the name escapes me, uh, looking at, at venous thrombosis and it contradicted an earlier study out of Europe. Um, there was a study that came out of the Netherlands showing that in fact, low gamma prime fibrinogen levels were associated with venous thromboembolism. But there was a larger US study that came out a couple of years ago showing that no, in fact, there was no association with venous thrombosis. And, and we've looked at a small cohort uh, that we got from Scripps Clinic and, and weren't able to see an association there, which surprised me because I, I thought because of all the biochemical um, aspects of gamma prime fibrinogen, it would be a setup um, for venous thrombosis. But again, Maybe it has to do with flow rates. I don't know. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to know what all is contributing. We don't know how it interacts with the, uh, the vessel wall. We did studies years ago uh, looking at thrombin bind or fibrinogen binding to uh, endothelial cells and shown that that actually uses a different binding site than the platelet binding site. So the platelet binding site is this AGDV sequence at the carboxyl end of the gamma A chain, whereas it seemed like the major binding site for endothelial cells was an RGD site in the A alpha chain. So yeah. that should be the same whether you have gamma prime or, or gamma A fibrinogen. So maybe if you had more gamma prime, you could argue that, yeah, you'd still have more clot bound thrombin on the endothelium, even in a venous situation, but we've never actually looked at that. Okay, great, thanks. Anyone else? Uh, Dave, what do you know about the uh, structure of gamma prime peptide and whether it recapitulates the region within the native protein? Boy, that's, that's been the $64,000 question. Um, it was, oh, what, what's it, Pineda et al. did the crystal structure, the co-crystal of thrombin with the gamma prime peptide. Um, and so that is probably the, the best guess we have, but that's probably an induced fit, right? Yeah. Because, um, so, you know, it's going to bind to the other electrostatic sites on thrombin, and that's going to twist it in a certain way. That region of the molecule, even in the gamma A form, has never been visualized. It does not uh, crystallize. And, and that was true in the, the Carolyn Cohen crystal and the Russ Doolittle crystal that came out like in 2000. So we, we absolutely do not know because it's never been visualized. It'll be mostly random coil probably because it's very high hydrophilic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, that was their explanation for why, um, you know, that region of fibrinogen did not uh, crystallize. Sure. Uh, and I'm also curious about whether uh, the, whether straight up heparin uh, being negatively charged or polyphosphate is going to have an inhibitory effect with these interacting, uh, that, that interacting peptide. You got to think it does. Yeah, we. I, I would just love to, to play with polyphosphate. Maybe I should call Jim Morrissey and ask. Him. Yeah, or or J, or Jay, because yeah. they in our in our in our gang. Yeah, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 That's uh, that's an unknown, but you're right. I mean, you've got these poly negative poly anions, you know, and exocyte one, exocyte two are anion binding exocytes. So. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the evidence that I've seen with polyphosphate, for example, is that it actually does change thrombin's activity and allows it to activate factor 11. Yeah. So, you know, that- It's different. Yeah, yeah. It, and, and with thrombin, as in real estate, it's location, location, location. You know, if you're stuck on heparin, you're going to do one thing. If you're stuck on thrombomodulin, you're going to do another thing. If you're stuck on GP1B, you're going to do something else. If you're on gamma prime, you'll do something else. So it's, it's just a flexible molecule that changes activity um, like night and day. Yeah. 
You know, and I was also thinking a little bit, and I maybe shouldn't even bring this up because it's kind of stupid, but I'm thinking <laughs> about I'm thinking about COVID inflammation in the lungs. I'm thinking about fibrinogen production in the lungs and the link there. Maybe we're getting gamma prime predominantly splice variant in the lungs because of inflammation. Thoughts? I, I have been trying to track down um, the people in our autopsy uh, group in pathology to see if I can't maybe get some <laughs> lung samples from dead COVID patients here and have not been real successful <laughs> in getting those. But I, I agree with you because yeah. the, 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 the one paper on this was um, by Patricia Simpson Hedaris, she did years ago with in vitro uh, lung, I think it was epithelial cells, showing that they did make fibrinogen, but there were at least expressed some of the chains. Mm -hmm. But but of course that was criticized as as well. It's it's in vitro, it's a line, you know, it's it's not normal. But you know, maybe she was right. And and maybe under conditions of inflammation, the lung literally makes fibrinogen and maybe gamma prime in particular. And could that account for a lot of the acute respiratory distress syndrome you see? Don't yeah, know, yeah. would love yeah. to test that. <laughs> well, anyhow, do we have any other discussion or question? Yeah, uh, so have you, has this ever been chucked into mice under various conditions? The, there, well, there have been attempts that the, uh, and uh, oh, shoot, I'm blocking on her name, North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, did or, the Gordon conference. Or Alyssa, Alyssa. Alyssa, yeah, thank you. Um, she showed um, that if you added, I think it was human fibrinogen into these mice and, and did a, a thrombosis uh, assay, that the gamma prime would actually protect them from thrombosis. There, there's a couple of caveats with that though. And one is that um, it isn't clear that mouse thrombin binds to the gamma prime chain. So mouse, mouse gamma prime is truncated at one of the um, sulfotyrosines. It's much, much shorter than human uh, gamma prime chain. In fact, there's, there's really very little conservation of that chain throughout different species. It's rather surprising. Oh. Um, so there, there's a, yeah, you, you don't really know uh, if you put human fibrinogen into mice, will it bind to their thrombin or is their thrombin not made to do that? So yeah, there, and, and uh, uh, another, oh shoot, forgot his name too. Uh, worked with Mike Moseson at uh, University of Wisconsin um, and they had made a, a gamma prime, I think it was human gamma prime chain hybrid with the mouse, um, fibrinogen that and got results with that. But again, the same caveats. We don't know that, that mouse thrombin and, and uh, gamma prime work in the same way as humans do. And, you know, we know that mice are very different for things like PAR receptors, you know, and it's probably because they are hypercoagulable to begin with, and they have to be because otherwise they'll bleed to death, you know, at the least little injury. So, uh, thank Kate. Kate Pratt from the other side of the continent. Did you have a question that you wanted to ask? I saw you. I saw your Kate. face. <laughs> Hi there. I see Helen is there too. Hi, Helen. Um, yeah, you actually just answered the question I was about to ask. I was wondering if there are other. I remember there were uh, big species differences, but are there? You know, is there an animal model um, that's more accessible than than you know non-human primates and and permissive permissive sort for SARS-CoV-2 infection? But it sounds like maybe not. So we're really looking at humans and autopsy samples. Um, yeah, well, we, we do have a primate center here at OHSU that, you know, maybe I should approach some of those folks and see if we can do some experiments there. But uh, yeah, that, that would be, you know, I think the best animal model of all. Another quick question, um, Dave, uh, is there any um, di difference between, uh, for example, the ratio of the total um, soluble fibrinogen A or gamma prime and the D-dimer? And um, have you been able to look at uh, different properties possibly of the D-dimer when you have the, the extremely elevated gamma prime? We have not, but that is an excellent idea. 
<laughs> you should go for it and test that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, that would be that would be a great study to do because you would think just a priori that if the gamma prime fibrinogen makes clots that are resistant to breakdown, maybe you would get less D-dimer. Um, and we we did show that in vitro back in a 1998 paper. Uh, where we showed that gamma prime lice is slower, that one chart, a graph I showed. Um, but again, that was in vitro and, you know, this hasn't been tested in humans. And yeah, it'd be interesting to know, is there an association between like your D-dimer level at any time and your gamma prime to gamma A ratio or something like that? Yeah, thanks. Wonderful. Well, not seeing any hands raised. Uh, Dave, thank you very much for triggering this great discussion and hope to see you soon.